themselves in a special way. Um, so these really unintentional ways that privilege plays out, when, when exploring your identities, you wanna be able to not, uh, not only understand where you fall, but understand what life might be like if you fell into a different identity. So again, there's a resource there that I hope you guys will use. I think it's a pretty good one, but there are tons more online as well. So once we've explored our identities, it's time to recognize our biases. Um, we know that there are implicit or unconscious biases, and then there are explicit or conscious biases. So I'll start with that explicit. You know, this is where we know it's there. Um, whether we want to address it or not, we, we identified it and, and we can recognize it. And those are actually the easier ones to change a lot of the times. Um, but what we're battling is so much more than our, than our explicit biases. We know that we are battling our implicit or unconscious biases, biases. And so um, I'll just give you another moment of vulnerability here. Um, <laughs> And I share this a lot. And the reason I share this is because I want people to understand that we should all be functioning from the space that it is very likely that I have some level of racial biases if I've never addressed them. If I've never thought about it, there is a very good chance that you are functioning at some level of implicit bias. And so for me, I remember so boldly the day that I realized that I myself as a, a biracial woman who is loved by people of color and loves people of color and has a daughter who's much darker skin than me with a different hair texture, that I had a bias against darker skin. And I went my whole life until about, I don't know, 10 years ago realizing this. Um, I was walking into my daughter's school and I looked over and she was sitting on the bench you know, even in school, we tend to see segregation happen almost naturally or, or because of the environments, what, for whatever reason. I walked in and when I noticed that my daughter was sitting with the people who looked like her, I kind of took a deep breath. And it, it, took me, it took me by surprise that I had any kind of reaction. But what I was experiencing was a realization of my own implicit bias that, um, that I had just not addressed before. And so as I began to explore that, I realized that, I mean, of course I have implicit bias. I'm raised in a community that's almost 88% Caucasian. Um, I have um, family members who I have seen um, exemplify racism. Uh, the media my entire life um, has been over-representing people of color in negative ways. Um, I like I um I I don't have it here, but I, I like to give the example. I grew up. Um, Ghostbusters was like one of my favorite shows. Um, but besides the black guy that was on the team of Ghostbusters, there weren't too many other people of color until you got to the jail, and then almost everybody in jail was a person of color. And this was not just true for Ghostbusters, but it was true on news reports, and it was true in in um, magazines, and it was true um, on on just regular. Um, entertainment TV, that people of color were being overrepresented. And so what that did is um, cause me to have these implicit biases, these stored memories somewhere back here that I'm not aware of, but are every day impacting my response. And since our brains respond um, to um, emotional things, just as it would a physical, emotional perceive of emotional threat, the same way it does to a physical threat, um, I had to acknowledge that those ideas that were negative sitting back here were actually causing me to behave in ways that were different towards people of different skin tone. And I had to recognize that I had been promoting, and I started to look at all the ways I had been promoting my daughter to be in um, environments that would promote, that would um, be more likely to give her a white group of friends. So that's embarrassing, right? It's uncomfortable to share that even still. But I share that because again, we should all be functioning from some level of understanding that we likely hold some implicit bias, whether within our control or not. If you were raised in America um, and you're at least 30 years old, I'm guessing that, that it's definitely something that you should at least address or at least look into. So um, recognizing our own biases. Um, I also included a, a link to a couple of resources 
that um, that helps us do that. Harvard, you guys have probably heard, did, um, a, there's an old implicit bias test that um, uses association and speed to determine if you have biases. So that's a good skill, uh, tool that I put on there. There's some other ones, but the point is, is that we have to explore our own implicit biases in a real intentional and serious way. Um, and then once you explore it, so you've explored your identities, you've recognized that you have biases in whatever way, and now how are you going to address them? So there's many, many ways to do that. Um, lots of online resources and things like that. I've added a few in, my, in the resources down low, below. But I, I chose for time purposes three areas that I think is really critical to discuss or to, to reflect on and um, when you're addressing your own biases. So one is development replacement re response, excuse me, develop replacement responses through empathy. So what that means, it's kind of like when you're trying to break a bad habit. Um, if I wanna stop smoking, I should chew gum and replace it. If I want to start eating healthy, I don't stop eating, I replace it with a healthy option. So it's kind of that same concept when it comes to addressing your implicit biases. And so how do you do that with empathy? Well, you sit and you imagine and you be intentional about finding ways to empathize with people of color. You do that by sitting and being intentional about recognizing you know, the, the systemic things um, as well as the implicit things and the explicit things that we see that are impacting that person's experience. And so when you really try to sit and put yourself in a person's shoes in a way that focuses on them in a strength-based way, you are able to replace some of those old memories that have been saved in your brain that you didn't realize were there with new ideas and perspectives and memory that are tied to empathetic thought and strength-based ideas towards people of color. So again, development, develop replacement responses for empathy is one of the key things I think we have to do to really be ready to talk to our students about race and diversity. Um, a second thing is to shift from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. So a fixed mindset would really focus on this idea that personality characteristics are fairly stable across a lifetime and they are very fixed in that way, therefore highly resistant to change. Well, people who have a fixed mindset about the characteristics or the behaviors of a student um, they are less, they are more likely to look at the student as an individual, as the reason for the behavior, and, um, and, and, and again, then see them less resistant to change. So I'll give you an example. A person with a fixed mindset who sees a student who's having trouble focusing in class. Uh, so, so with a fixed mindset, you're again likely to apply that student to that student and you're going to say, okay, well that student doesn't like my class, that's why he doesn't pay attention. Or maybe it's that that student's lazy and that's why he doesn't pay attention. Or he just doesn't care and so he doesn't pay attention. So it really takes, it really just puts all of the pressure on that child and then the focus of correction on that child as well. Um, so a person with a growth mindset, in contrast to that, is going to be far more likely to look for external factors that are influencing that student's behavior. So when we think about students of color and we understand the ex difference of experiences and the systemic issues that we have around racism, then you can start thinking about like, then you're more likely to think about, well, do I need to learn if this student is staying up late at night watching his younger siblings? It's more likely um, that that's going to happen with your students of color. Um, uh, unfortunately, because of the way our, our nation and systems are set up, um, students of color are also going to be more likely to have food insecurity. Is this student hungry and, mal and, and, and not having a full belly to keep him energized? Or is, is, is even homelessness? But it really, that growth mindset really encourages you to seek reasons for the behavior and seek empathy for that stu student of color in a new way that will also move us to seek solutions that are broader than just that student. So again, um, to address your own biases, shifting from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset 
is, is critically important. Um, a, third, a third point that I want to make about um, addressing your own bias is the benefit of increased positive exposure to people of color. So um, it, it goes back to being able to empathize. Um, the more you get to know people, um, the more you can understand their experiences, but also you can have positive experiences that produce positive thoughts and contradictions to the stereotypes and the negative ideas that have created these implicit biases that are still sitting back there in your head. So again, this increased exposure is going to give you um, new ideas, mindsets, perspectives, new thoughts to replace those old ones that you are hoping to um, address. There's lots of ways to increase positive exposure. Um, sometimes it's a little difficult. Like I said, I, I live, um, I grew up in a community um, that was 88% uh, white population. And so exposure and access to people of color, um, a lot of the times if you were not a person of color, you had to be fairly intentional about seeking that relationship or intentional about attending different cultural events that will give you insight and in, in, in relationship with people from diverse backgrounds, especially around race. Um, so increasing exposure goes beyond that. Um, you can do it by reading a book that really highlights positivity for people of color. Um, you can maybe um, read something that corrects a false narrative that was taught to you um, as a younger person and stayed with you. I know many things that I were taught growing up in the public school system just didn't reflect truth, um, but also spent a lot of time giving tribute to people who were white and much less time um, giving positive information about people of color. And so whether it be through media, um, reading a book, uh, entertainment, um, building personal relationships, we have to find ways to increase positive exposure to people of color to continue addressing our own implicit biases. So those are the three I want to touch on. But again, there are so many more. Um, I encourage you, you know, I'm going to keep saying be intentional to um, re look, at, look, because there are so many classes you can audit for free there and get a certificate even. There's just so many resources online whenever you really get intentional about addressing your own implicit biases. So another way um, to prepare yourself and be really self-aware is that, and, um, that you understand the consequences of implicit biases. So whenever we think about it on an individual level, like, okay, I might have some ideas back there that I'm working on, but how much impact does that really have? So, um, you know, perhaps you as an individual won't have a significant negative impact on a student of color, um, but, collectively as a system, an educational higher ed system that is predominantly white, if there is a heavy presence of these implicit biases, over time what we see is exactly what we see today. And that's disparities of outcome when we look at our retention rates and when we look at um, ability um, to just overcome certain barriers. Uh, so you, we really have to understand that the impact of implicit bias is significant and is absolutely essential to be addressed on a, on a huge level of a lot of individuals paying attention to it to begin to shift our systems um, that are, are oppressive and, and not giving equal or equity of experience to people who are of color and people who are not. So once, once, that, once you have the, the deeper understanding you have of the impact, um, because we love our students, because we, we wanna be the best we can be for them, the more motivated you're going to be to really do um, those intentional efforts to address our own biases. So that's part of preparation, but also to understand, not only for our own biases, but to understand the experience of our students and, and continue to grow in that empathy and that cultural competency. So um, I put this, I've been mentioning it, but understand systemic oppression well, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. I'm sure I'm just recapping things that you already know, but I wanna make sure that I touch on it because it is such an important thing that we have an understanding of um, how policies, procedures, 
um, really impact racism and oppression towards people of color, um, it's important to kind of take a moment to think about our history, right? Um, it's important to understand that the families of power um, that were generally um, white, male, wealthy men, that they were the ones making the, that the built the systems, right? And, and this was happening during a time that um, a lot of them were just not looking out for the black man um, in that way. Um, really, it just, it, they were, they just, there wasn't even a mindset yet um, of the need to provide equity and equality for all people. We know that in our history. So what happened over time is um, these systems remained fairly consistent, consistent in who was leading, consistent in who had power, and eventually um, the systems themselves became racist in the ways that they functioned and the lack of supports that were provided for our students of color. It, um, that, that, that history of not really treating fairly people of color um, naturally bled into our major system. So again, we're going to talk about that a little more, but I do encourage you for your own preparation to have conversations that you have a really good understanding of what that looks like and how that, and how that comes, how that kind of came about and how it's manifesting today. Um, and then again, I just want to touch on the importance of being willing to be authentic and invulnerable a little bit. It's just they're, they're um, tough conversations that require you to open up a little bit and our students to open up a little bit to really benefit from them, um, open up their thinking, open up their mind, their heart, all of those things. So we have to model that for them, um, as I hope I did a couple times today for you. Okay, so after we've prepared ourselves, we're like, okay, I feel really like I've really increased in cultural competency and empathy and understanding of systemic racism and all of and consequences of implicit versus implicit bias. Now you're preparing your classroom, right? So one of the things that's really important is to be proactive to create an inclusive classroom culture. Um, I've seen so many times that like right before the tough talks, um, people are scrambling around to kind of define their community norms and come up with, you know, and teach what does active listening look like and, and what does respectful responses sound like. And so what's such a better strategy is that from day one in your classrooms or to your students or in your spaces that you are promoting inclusive environments. And I said classrooms realizing that probably some of you are more in office, but you get what I'm saying. Um, so some ideas on how to do this. Is, again, lots of ways to do this, but for time purposes, I have pointed out some of my favorites. So inclusive visuals. Um, this is a really simple thing to do is to be aware of the visuals that are in your spaces and how they can have an impact on different people. So for me, as a person from the LGBTQ plus community, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer, um, it means something. When I walk into an office, when I walked into my therapist's office and I saw that equality sign just off in the corner, this barrier just completely broke down and I felt like I was in the room of an ally instantly. And so I say this um, not to, um, discourage anyone from 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 their faith but just to be on this next piece but just to be aware of how the ways we present our faith may um impact our students so um with um i know i'm off of race for a second but this is my example of how visuals are very impactful so i um as an lgbtq plus person i also walked into an office before a therapist office before that had a cross hanging on the wall and even though it may not have been true, I'm living the Bible Belt, Southwest Missouri, um, I instantly got concerned and nervous that she would not be accepting of me or able to empathize or understand with me. So creating inclusive visuals is really important. However you plan to do that, representation of people of color um, in different ways, whether it be pictures of students or, what, or, or marketing that we put out, um, we know that that um, inclusive visuals is so important. So um, also with our education, so uh, within ourselves, we talked about making sure that we have accurate education around, you know, some really key issues and um, related to race, but make sure that we're presenting education in a way that's also inclusive, that we are balanced with the amount of negative or positive that may be discussed about a certain group. 
um, and just being very um, accurate in history. For me, it was it was hard to realize that Thanksgiving dinner didn't happen exactly the way they taught me when we wore our feathers and pilgrim hats in elementary school. Um, so education is a critical piece. Um, also celebration. So a lot of us like to like decorate our doors and different things. Um, so are, do, are we inclusive in that? And so again, we're just trying to build that inclusive culture from the beginning, these little things that we do so that when we move into these tough conversations, we're already, are, we're already kind of taking that proactive step. So I, um, a lot of people like to celebrate like Christmas, but, but do you also take time to put a decoration up for Hanukkah or, um, or Kwanzaa? Um, you know, am I spending as much time celebrating Easter when I give out eggs with candy across the office as I did celebrating Cinco de Mayo? So celebrations and the way that we do those, even in the most subtle way, can really impact whether or not our students of color feel like they are included and that, that it is inclusive culture. Um, so the last thing I want to highlight about um, promoting that, being proactive for that is always taking opportunities to highlight diversity and the value of it. So that can be really simple, like statements that are simple such as, wow, that's so different than I think. I'm glad that you helped me understand that better. Um, or, you know, I think that um, our classmate or the student over here um, really comes from a different experience. I think it'd be valuable to pull them in on this conversation. So always looking for ways just to highlight to our students that value of diversity and inclusion. And again, we're still preparing our classroom. So we kind of did some internal work and now really like doing the work before the discussion starts. Um, so another thing that's really important, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are so many different responses that you might get when you're having diversity and inclusion, uh, diversity conversations around race. So you need to be prepared for them um, and you need to be prepared to support your students, especially those of color who are often the ones who have been taking on an emotional labor related to racism and different things for such an extended time that it may be um, a little more of a difficult conversation for them to have, not to mention the increased vulnerability it will require if they are a minority student in a predominantly white space. So um, I do this, I'm gonna highlight three ways that I do this. So one is from the beginning of working with students, I find ways to increase emotional intelligence. So whether that's in an advising meeting or in a group session activity, um, having a level of emotional intelligence will just help to um, move conversations forward as emotions arise or reactions arise around um, not only having emotions, but experiencing the emotions of others during these potentially um, difficult conversations around race. So um, there's so many ways to do it. Just a quick example of how I did. We did a charades game around emotion. So even though they were college students, they had a blast acting out the different emotions and, and guessing them. And then we moved into conversations about how to um, approach situations where we feel these different emotions, but also how to support each other um, when we, when, and, and how to identify these things in other people. So again, really just, if you have opportunities to um, talk about emotional intelligence or to promote emotional intelligence before these discussions, it's a really helpful thing that just helps things move a little smoother. Um, it's important to have some level of support staff available if you think the conversation may move into something a little deeper. And the truth is, is it's really difficult to have an authentic conversation that's, that's, um, tr that, uh, that really expresses the truth and also is able to help students relate it to, to, to racism and oppression that they see today. The civil rights movement is something that um, is always going to be talked about in classrooms. You never know when that conversation is going to veer off into emotional conversation that was deeper than you intended. So even if even if you think there's a potential that there might be a high emotional response, um, you need to have a little support in that. And so that might be um, a coworker, a co a colleague. It may be a counselor. Whoever it is, um, 
or it may be you saying, I'm going to provide time after this. If anyone, you know, needs to decompress or needs to unpack a little more, it's really important to provide that space, especially for your students of color, again, because they're usually going to be in sp spaces when they're minority in higher ed. And so they, they're feeling that pressure even a little bit more in those conversations. So got to have support staff set up or you yourself be prepared to provide additional support in some way. Um, again, I put student support here just because how can you encourage, maybe you bring in some, some student leaders or maybe you call on a couple students that are going to really act as student support just in case. Um, just in case someone needs to leave the room, um, that's a really important piece to have. Um, also on the front end, you need to have an environment where you kind of have already developed, at least in your own mind, and beginning to integrate community norms. So these are going to be things like I mentioned, active listening. Um, these are going to be things like respectful responses. Um, um, everyone, let them finish talking. Um, everyone can be heard. You know, these really inclusive community norms are important in any space for any conversation. So really implementing them as early as possible and correcting behaviors that do not align with them as early as possible will help when you get to those difficult conversations around race and diversity. Because again, you've already kind of cultivated this classroom culture um, of being able to communicate and in an effective and respectful manner. Because believe me, I've seen conversations around race and diversity go so many different directions so quickly. So have that strategy developed and integrated into your classroom already or your, into your spaces already. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. I just realized that I was um, moving the wrong PowerPoint. That's the, there's my grace I need. Okay, guys, that was the one grace. Um, so that was the screen that I just went over. I apologize that you guys didn't have that in front of you. Um, but again, um, preparing your classroom. So you want to prepare yourself and then have some front end work before the conversation. And a lot of that really should start way before the conversation. Okay, so now you're ready to start that conversation. Um, about race and diversity with your students. So sometimes I've seen people that display community norms or will bring them out and actually review them right before a difficult conversation just to remind the students um, what the expectations are. You know, we, we know that we need to set clear expectations and sometimes that's around something so simple as we will not interrupt the other person talking or we will not over talk, you know, whatever those community norms are. So I think um, for me personally, um, anytime I do uh, a, a training that I think could go uh, uh, be a little emotional, I, I review the community norms. There needs to be an opt out for responses. So I don't encourage that you easily, that you initially give an opt out of the entire activity or conversation because I think it's really beneficial for um, Multi, you know, different people to be in that room. And because it's an uncomfortable conversation, sometimes our students will opt out more quickly. Um, but to opt out of responses. And so basically, you just give students the permission to not lean into the discomfort if they don't want to. However, as you give them the opt out option it's also very important that you are giving them the acknowledgement that discomfort is, is, is expected and normal and teaching them that leaning into that discomfort is where we grow. You know, that like there's this line out here and, and on one side of the line is where I live all the time and it's comfortable, but I don't really grow in that space as much as I do when I begin to lean into that discomfort. You know, those new experiences, those things we're not as used to, that's when we really grow and that's what we're wanting to see from our students. So encouraging them to lean in and making it okay that when you're uncomfortable to still raise your hand and have a response. So um, always inform them that there are those additional emotional re supports available. So not only have them available, it makes your students understand clearly that they're available. Um, one thing to consider is, is there an opportunity to increase representation, especially in spaces where um, there may be minority students of color that are the vast minority. And so what can tend to happen is, um, 
the, the conversation or the perspectives can lean heavily on one direction and really quiet or silence the voice of the minority student. And so when that happens, um, we need to align with that student the best we can and really act as a balance for that power in that room between the majority and the minority students. But one another way you can um, balance that is if you have, again, a student leader or somebody, a student, a, um, a co-worker or somebody to bring into that conversation um, to provide some representation for your minority students. And then, of course, emphasize that racism is not a thing of the past, that it is absolutely happening today. And again, tying history to examples of how it manifests in today's world um, is fairly easy to do. And um, one way that I find our students really connect and, and, and accept that racism is really a big deal in our society today. Okay, so we have prepared ourselves, we prepared our classroom, and we, um, are starting that conversation. Um, I find that there are, um, when people begin to realize that they either have been blind to racism or that they have participated um, because of their implicit bias or otherwise, um, or their families have, there's a sense of shame that arises behind that. And we have to kind of, we have to try to mitigate that as much as possible because when we feel shaming, it's not something that we really want to engage in highly. So, um, What's happening? Huh. Okay. Um, so removing the shame again, focus on that implicit bias piece, kind of, you know, those things aren't your fault, the media that was given to you, um, focus on factors that influence implicit bias. Um, the way our brain functions, it's normal human aspect of cognition to group things and, and favor things. So understanding how that works and how to share that with your students focusing on that implicit bias. Um, also understanding, expressing that upbringing really affects our implicit bias um, and family values sometimes can affect that. Limited exposure can affect that. So focusing on the things that are not a direct result of the student, but something about their environment that really had an impact on the way that they, as they're recognizing their own biases, um, they don't have to internalize it quite so much. Um, in, in the sense that um, it's something that they did or didn't do. And then again, emphasize systemic racism. So um, I think that data is powerful. Um, it, and so when we say systemic racism, we know that that means that there is differences of experiences and um, oppressive systems across the board in the United States. Like there is not one well, if you know one, please let me know so I can stop saying that because I have not found one, one system that does not have disparities of outcomes for people of color and unequal treatment. So let's look at that for a second. Um, our financial system, I was reading recently how still today, people of color, their houses are valued less than people with comparable houses who are owned by a white person. So in real estate and finance, we know that buying a home and selling your home and all that thing, that, that's a really a big part of moving forward in the world. And if that's unfair, you know, that, that really puts a burden and causes those disparities for people of color. So in our financial system, in our educational system, we know what our retention rates look like. We know that um, you know, students um, K through 12 are five times more likely to be suspended if they are a student of color. And that's not just nationally. What's interesting is there's been several places like Lee Summit, who's not very far from us, who did some research on this. They, they put in the intentional work. They, they, they looked and reviewed their, their uh, disciplinary records and they, find, they found that they fell right in there. And, they, and then they, they later then um, responded by investing a lot of money in diversity and inclusion efforts, which is kind of what we're all gonna have to do is invest our resources, time, money, money, and energy into being more inclusive. Um, so um, criminal justice system, and this is the last one for time purposes that I'll focus on, but I, I, I'd like to share this example because it blew my mind when I learned it. So um, when you think about these external factors that are impacting our students and are um, um, affecting issues related to race and diversity, um, the family structure really matters. And in the mid 80s through the early 90s, there was this big push in the criminal justice system that um, was a war on drugs. 
And that war on drugs was focused on um, a drug called crack cocaine, right? Okay, so crack cocaine is a byproduct of regular cocaine. Just hang with me, just hang with me because it's a really powerful, uh, um, um, when, you, when you do the research and realize what's happening in our criminal justice system, it's one of those really powerful moments. And um, we, we keep seeing those, but this is one of them um, that, that, I, that moved me the most. So um, the war on drugs um, was really focused on crack cocaine, which was typically used by communities of color. And again, a byproduct of cocaine, which was used by communities that were generally white. It was the more expensive of the two. So um, our efforts, our legislation, um, our policies and law enforcement really said that the war on drug was about crack. And so what we did is we went in and we only attacked the black communities heavily. And we took a lot of fathers and brothers and uncles out of the homes. And we didn't just take them out of the home, but if, but we charged them up to 100 times harsher for having crack cocaine than regular cocaine. So, so just to recap, so the guy over here that's white and more likely to have regular cocaine gets caught with a gram of cocaine and he gets, uh, he gets like 10 days, right? But then the guy over here that gets caught with crack cocaine gets up to a thousand days for a very similar drug. But because we have racist systems and, 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 and the systemic racism affecting our students. Um, so anyways, um, removing shame means you emphasize the systemic side of racism that also, again, allows that student not to internalize it so much, not to feel that shame and guilt and, um, and understand that, that what we're talking about is an issue that, that all of us should really look into and not necessarily the fault of anything that someone did or did do. So diving a little deeper. So, um, I am going into my time, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize this just a little bit. Um, race is a social construct. This is something that helps students kind of detach the idea that one human being is better than another. Which, um, to be completely honest, is where we're at today. That that um, people of darker skin are often devalued and viewed as lesser than, or not as competent, or as many positive things that the white person might be. So really detaching the idea that that is a natural thing and understanding that um, we as a society formed race because it's the way our brains work. We group people and we divide people out by different things. And so just helping our students understand that this idea that one person biologically is better than another isn't actually why the concept of race came about. Sharing personal experiences, I've shared a couple of mine today, so being willing to share those. I mean, I know it's hard sometimes to be vulnerable with our, in front of our students, but it's necessary if we expect them to open up for us and really have these um, conversations that are effective around race and diversity. The privilege and power talk. So um, I just wanna say that white privilege is a word that like instantly, I've shut down entire rooms by not preparing um, and not having the proper language to talk about white privilege. So we are acknowledging when we talk about white privilege that it has nothing to do with how much you did or did not struggle or how hard you did or did not work. We're simply saying that your, your struggle was not harder because of the complexion of your skin. Where your students of color, their struggle is harder. Whatever struggle they're in is going to be more difficult because of to overcome because of the color of their skin in the American society. So having that privilege talk and, and understanding how that relates to power. Um, there's a couple activities in the resource that I love, the privilege walk and crossing the line that are really good for working with students to understand this concept. We always need to be focused on correction and reconciliation um, because we all need to address our implicit biases. It's important that we um, are open to allowing people to correct those things, address those things, grow, and then um, reconciliation. So if there was something that offended you, giving a person space to grow to a place that we allow them to um, be, be forgiven and be open to them again, um, even though you may have had a poor experience around race in the past. So the last thing is um, do check-ins. Uh, because this can be emotionally taxing on your students and it's really hard to tell when it's gonna go there. Um, I like to do um, one word flash. 
um, basically asking students um, to tell one word about how they feel. I often will do it if I feel a room becoming heavy or tense in a way that I'm not quite ready for and need to gauge. Um, I don't only listen to their responses, but I, but I hear their tones and I see their face and I look for signs of stress um, to determine like, am I diving too deep? Um, have we gone to a level of emotional labor that I'm not really ready to um, support them in just yet? Or, you know, just really doing check-ins whenever you, and being aware of what the climate is in the room at that moment. So um, now that you've um, died, you have dove in to the discussion, um, I want to do a little breakout session, but first, do I have any questions or any comments that anyone wants to make? Bill, I have a question. Um, how do we know what, I guess what I'm trying to ask, like some of what you talked about is, is, is elevated thinking and not all students may, may be at that level or um, may come in at, at more of a, I don't really know, I'm just kind of here, I want to hear what you have to say kind of place. So how do we draw out their questions? Um, how do we start that discussion with them? Um, from all the different levels of understanding. Yes. yes. So I I suggest that you um, one is making sure that you're creating a culture that's having discussions about differences and inclusion from the beginning. But then when you're coming to that conversation, so I I I can't go through them in our time frame, but I did include lots of different resources about specifics to having conversation around multiple identities. So mm -hmm. those are going to give you a lot of different tips um, because it's going to be different um, in different spaces. I'm, I don't know. I'm guessing we're working with high school and college students. Um, mm -hmm. So even just between those students, it can look very differently. If you're working in a group that is um, typically accustomed to really diverse settings. That's gonna require a different type. Um, so what I recommend is using the activities as a way to really deepen understanding. Things like the privilege walk and crossing the line, they are these really experiential activities I mean, obviously we can't always move into an activity, but um, they're really helpful when you can. And then as far as specific language and statements that you might make, there's gonna be a lot of those in the resources that I provided as well. So um, it's really important to just kind of know your audience in that way, um, engage that the best you can before these conversations so you kind of know where they're at and where you need to begin. So I did, that didn't give you a specific statement, but I hope it gives you um, some direction and the value of using activities. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Okay, well, um, the next thing that I wanna do is we're gonna break up into breakout sessions, um, about eight to 10 a group. I'm not sure how many people are here, I'm sorry. So um, Karen is working on the tech side of things. She'll kind of divide us up in breakout rooms here in a moment. You'll get a request to join a breakout room and it'll randomly divide us. And what we are going to do is, I want each of you to go around and rate yourself on how you feel your level of readiness to have conversations with your students around race and diversity is? What do you feel like your level of readiness right now is? And it gives a, just a brief explanation. We're gonna do this for about 20 minutes. So um, if we're in groups of 10, eight to 10, then you, you know, you'll have a couple minutes to kind of tell what your rating is for yourself um, as far as readiness and give a brief explanation of why you rated it. And maybe you're not like giving the full explanation, but here's one piece of why I rated where I did. Um, so rating one to five, um, being one not prepared at all, two not very prepared, somewhat prepared at three, well prepared and completely prepared at five. So I'll leave the screen up um, so that you guys remember those ratings. Um, then you will combine your rate, you will combine your ratings and come back with a group number. So the average number of your rating, you're gonna bring that back to the larger group. Does that make sense, Doc? Did that, did, did, should I explain that again? 
So one more time, just to be clear, I may, oh, just in case I, just in case I didn't get it correctly. Um, um, there is, oh goodness. Okay. There is, um, there is, um, you're going to go to your group. Each person will give a rating of how prepared they think they are to engage students around race and diversity and have that conversation. You will then combine your number, your, your ratings and come up with an average rating. Bring that rating back. Also take a moment to kind of tell a, mo a bit of why you gave that rating. So we'll go ahead now, Karen, and split off for the next 20 minutes into our breakout sessions. And then we'll come back together and um, see what our self-evaluated collective rating is for readiness to have these conversations. I'm interested to know what that is. So we will go ahead and break off. Okay. Are we, Karen, I think you're in our group. Are we in a group? Is this the breakout? Um, yes, it, it shows that you're in breakout too, but you, if you don't do anything, if you just stay where you are and don't click on anything, that there's, there's about five or six in a room because it looks like a bunch of people um, had to fall off for other meetings. Um, okay. So... I thought three right, so um, maybe we could just do 15 minutes then. Sure. Okay, great. Looks like almost everyone has joined a room. So when, um, when you want, I can uh, type a message that goes to the, to the team so that or it goes to, to everyone basically. Um, you know, maybe we give them a five minute warning or something like that. Um, and they're able to choose a spokesperson to speak about, um, you know, how your team chose their rating and where they feel they are. It says they will close in 60 seconds. So they probably get a notification and then we'll come back. All right. Um, is, is, is the five, everyone's here now? I'm sorry, on my end, I can't tell like how many participants are showing or anything like that. Everyone, it looks like everyone's back. Okay, cool. So, um, I, I could get a representative from each group. How many groups did we have, Karen? I'm sorry. We had three groups. Three groups. 
Okay, from the three groups, what were the, the readiness ratings that you come up with as an average? And so if I can just have one person from each group tell me what that I'll is. I'll speak for our group. We had um, an average of 3.5. Okay, that's pretty ready. I, All right. From our group, we were... 3.31. I'm sorry. Yeah, maybe a, a 3. Point, a little higher than the 3, a 3.12 or something like that. But about a little more than a 3. Yep. And we had a 3.31. Okay, about a 3.3. .3. So we feel like we're kind of like somewhat prepared for the conversation. Um, I hope when you review some of the resources that you um, will have more of the specifics um, as what type of questions to ask. I really function from a space of um, kind of giving, giving you a little broad um, approach and then you'll know what's good for your class when you look at those resources but i did want to just really quick um give you an example um, of something that can be a really good conversation starter um initially with our students um so uh so this ooh, did my share go away oh there it is well so one thing I want to point out is that whenever you discuss diversity more broadly um, and include various identities, it puts a little bit less emotion um, pressure on a room that may have a small number of minority people by race. Because what it does is it builds, a, whenever you discuss identities first as like kind of a first question to identify where your identities are, it helps to recognize that many of us are in this position of um, being an, um, an underrepresented or um, an overly negative represented group or um, so it kind of it kind of um, connects that to where there it's not just one person because of their race feeling like they um, experienced I'm sorry guys, I lost my, I'm, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. I've gotten way better with Zoom. Can, but um, clearly I could do, I could do even better. So um, there it is. Can you guys see my PowerPoint? No? We see a blank uh, screen right now. Okay. All right, so I want to get you guys out of here. I know that this has been a little bit longer than the hour I intended it to be. Um, so our average score is a 3.3. Um, just take a look at those resources, though, because there are going to be some more specifics. And I just want to point out that a really good place to start when people are like, I've never even thought about this, is um, that kind of that first step that I ask you guys to do as far as um, that self-reflection and exploring your own identities. Um, taking students through that process is a really good first place to start. Um, so the last thing here is, I can't, I'm sorry, it's shifted formats and I'm, okay, there we go, there's screen share right there. So the last thing I just wanna encourage you guys um, that, um, we are at a 3.3, so that's actually pretty good. Um, but there's plenty of work to be done to really make us comfortable and more confident having these conversations. So just be intentional, be proactive, and be determined is what I encourage you in. Utilize the resources that are out there um, and continue in that journey of self-exploration around your own identities and exploring your own biases. Um, the one-on-one the, the -on -one interactions that we have with our students and the way that we model that and the way that we are able to connect with them will be one of the biggest indicators of if we're able to have effective conversations around race and diversity. So are there any questions? All right, well, thank you guys so much again for letting me be here. I hope that there's something everyone took from it. If you have any questions, um, you're certainly, um, Dr. Stewart has my contact information, or I can, um, if you have any questions, follow-up questions, um, please let me know. I can give her my email if anyone has any. 
that we can um, put on the chat. Um, actually, Karen, just in case anyone has questions, would you mind putting my email out on the chat real quick? Because I, I don't have the capability to chat from here, I don't think. I will do that. Hold on. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you guys again so much. Um, before we go, last thing, can I get a one word flash? Just one word about how you're feeling about um, the, 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 um, the information that you just received. And we'll just kind of start at the top with Lolita. And you can opt out of this. Oh, um, I'm fine. <laughs> uh, I would say engaged. Okay. And Ashley? I would say um, maybe energized to do this work. Thank you. And Karen? I would say enlightened. Dr. Stewart? I already saw the word, but uh, after meeting with my group, I'll say it again, uh, encouraged. And Gregory? How about Ryan? Resolute. Rose? Optimistic. Nick? That's exactly what I was going to say. Optimistic. Serena? Enlightened. I'm sorry? Enlightened. Oh. And Laura? Connected. Scott. Kelsey? I would say equipped. Pamela. Encouraged. Um, I'm Mercedes. I think I, I don't think I said Mercedes yet. I think she's muted. Um, Mon 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 Monshonda? It's Monshonda, yes. Determined. 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 All right, is there anyone I left out? Well, thank you for taking the extra moment to do that. It really helps me just kind of gauge um, how I left everyone feeling and um, if the training um, satisfied some of what you were looking for. So thank you. I do appreciate that um, feedback and you all have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dola. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Dola. It was a pleasure to work with you and to meet you. Um, I also am feeling, feel determined also. I like that last slide, be intentional and proactive and determined. I think it's just, if we aren't, who will be? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I, I know those of us, in, or I'm, I'm actually, those of you in TRIO, I'm in a similar program um, that just serves a high number of minority students. And so, um, yes, there will be a high need for us. And, and, I, and I know we have the hearts for it or we wouldn't be here. <laughs>